I'm Tracy Adler, Johnson Co-Director of the Welland and Curator of Yeshua Class Our Labor, and we're thrilled to be joined with Yeshua today. The exhibition opens tomorrow and runs through June 12, so we hope that you will take the time to see it in person, and this is just a little virtual preview of some of the works that you'll be able to see in the show. So welcome, Yeshua. I'm Yeshua Kloss. Welcome to our labor here at the Welland. So we're really excited to talk about this piece, which is called Our Labor, and the show was named after the piece. Um, and it, as you could see from the opening shot, it is an enormous piece, and it really is the center point or heart around which the entire exhibition was developed. So let's talk about some of the elements in the, in the piece that uh, led to both the genesis of it, but some of the sure. characters and personalities that appear. So you're looking at a very small part of a 40 foot long, 15 foot high tapestry mural. This is all woodblock prints that are collaged onto uh, canvas. They're printed on muslin cloth and then collaged onto the canvas behind me. So what's interesting about this mural, this was based on Diego Rivera's famous Detroit industry mural that he made in 1933. It depicts the auto workers at that time in the Ford uh, auto plant in Detroit as a commission by the Ford family. And 1933, it was white men working in the factory. And I saw this mural when I visited this newfound family of mine. And uh, I felt left out of the mural. I felt that my family's contribution had been left out. So I've replaced his uh, faceless white male workers with the portraits of my family members um, all in the mural. So you're seeing a small part. And when you get close, you'll see interesting details like things where um, a cousin of mine was having a birthday and she's getting a kiss on the cheek from someone else. And I don't know who that person is. I think it might be her daughter, but this is a photo that I did a screen grab from Facebook um, in order to get her portrait. So a lot of the project is about the distance between my family and I, and I'm trying to bridge that estrangement uh, through making this mural. And another function of this mural is that it's a family tree, right? So I've organized um, the relationships of the portraits in the mural in accordance to familial relationships. So uh, grandma is here in the center. And this is a really important part of Diego's original mural because the figure uh, is dropping the motor. Right, and the motor is of course the heart of the car, and it's the engine. My grandmother had 15 children, which my father was one of, so it's a very large family, and this mural was a way to help me understand uh, all these fami new familial relationships in my place in the family. And your father and his siblings are at the top, grandma's in the center, and then down here are all the cousins. And what's also interesting, if you have a chance to zoom in, is how the techniques vary. Some of the areas are hanging, some of them are adhered, so there's this dimensional quality that's yeah. both implied in the creation of the work, yeah. but actually dimensional too in real yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, I love that materiality, right, and the limitation of material. So there are those moments where I'm really leaning into the material itself, and other moments where I'm inviting the viewer to kind of accept this illusionistic space and that you know, again, this is operating as a diagram uh, of family relationships. And we can also talk about one of the sculptures, Auntie Grandma, which brings together the family tree with yeah. also the implied um, engines and motors um, of the Ford Motor Plant, which are intrinsic to this body of work. Right, so Grandma makes another appearance over here. So as we're panning, you can see that it very much looks like a tree limb from that perspective, but as you move along to this side, you see that it's actually a tree limb fused with a car engine. You want to talk about why this car engine is so symbolic? Yeah, here? yeah. So this is a car engine model that would have been made in the year that I was born. 
at the Ford Auto Plant. There are 15 branches, so that's one branch for each of grandma's children sprouting from the engine. Um, so I'm really here challenging the notion of the family tree as this bucolic, symmetrical, uh, perfect uh, family tree. And this one is, you know, you can tell that it's, it's creating um, its own life. Um, and it's being generated from this Ford motor engine. Uh, the, the one, I guess, little secret part also is that there's a little self-portrait of myself uh, here as the extension of the family. And that was the last part that, uh, that I added. And so there's aspects of this which look very architectural, which yeah. look very landscape, which almost look topographical. Right. And then there's aspects of it that look very much machine made. Yeah. And it's that marriage, like as a family tree, like we see that here in the mural too. We see flowers and vines embedded and, you know, winding around the, the different machine components that some of which were obviously from the, um, the Diego Rivera mural, and some of which were of your imagining. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this, the, this natural component of these, this sort of, um, these vines, the wildflowers, weeds, this is a reoccurring theme throughout the show. Uh, I'm thinking about rewilding. So I'm thinking about the way that um, in cities across America, specifically the Midwest and Detroit, where there once was a thriving economy based around the auto industry that, uh, that has collapsed as jobs have been uh, displaced overseas and the industry has changed so much. And the question is, what those, all those people that contributed the work and labor to those economies, how have they been left behind, right? So what we see is that the earth is reclaiming a lot of those emptied out buildings and factories, warehouses, and uh, of course, living spaces as well. So that's, that's also happening a lot in the student project. Yes. So with the Parts Untangle is the next piece that we are going to discuss. This was a wonderful collaboration between Yeshua and seven of our Hamilton students. And as you can see, unlike the, our labor mural, there's no portraits here. Um, but one of the things that you talked about was the car which is both shown in an expanded exploding form and then the car composed on the other side are for you almost stand-ins for the figure. Right, so I found this exploded diagram of this Ford auto, automobile and immediately it kind of reminded me of, um, of a body that hadn't been put together, right? And of course there's relationships between the word body and auto body and the idea of uh, the body as a vehicle, right? As a vehicle for spirit or something larger than physical presence. So I was really interested in that. Uh, fortunate that I had seven students to help me do this because after I printed that original car, we reprinted that same block, which you'll see later. And we assembled from that block these prints to make the second car. So then the question of the collaboration was, how are these two car bodies interacting? And I think a lot of that interaction was based on words like migration and sprawling. I'm thinking about my family's movement, like many black families up from the South to the Midwest for those jobs in industry. And I also think about the word sprawling because of course it's used for uh, wildlife and vines and weeds, but also for population urban sprawl. Right. And all the flowers that are represented, what's, what's interesting is that they're prints, but they're all unique. Every flower is a wild flower that right. grows in Detroit. Yeah. But unlike the typical process of printmaking where there's a lot of repetition, they're all unique. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to printmaking more generally? Yeah, I mean, I guess the easy way to respond to that is to say that's just me being defiant. <laughs> I think that um, we know that printmaking is useful for uh, making the same thing over and over. Um, in a way, I'm you know, doing a lot of painstaking work to just produce one thing sometimes. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess it's also about the uniqueness of each individual flower in this case, and vine in this case, that 
um, while it could be reproduced, um, it just isn't. It refuses a kind of commodification or a kind of uh, you know, gesture of repetition, which is something, again, that we could relate to like factory work. Mm -hmm. So there's something that's defiant uh, in that rewilding process. And, and you talked about the process of working with the students. That was the first time you've done big project and you felt like it was like an assembly line. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was interesting because uh, that's something that the students pointed out to me actually uh, as we began to organize and divide the labor to do this mural. Um, besides that, we were all dressed in uh, worker jumpsuits. Mm -hmm. so. I think there were moments where we said, you know, this is interesting. We're, we're compartmentalizing the labor into these different activities and then passing them along the chain of production in order for other groups uh, to finish the labor. So we were kind of operating like an assembly line. And I was really kind of excited by that mm -hmm. idea and how that's feeding back into the work. And maybe just to comment a little bit about our labor in general and the word labor, because for you it's, it's, it's about like the labor and the work that you're doing to get to know this part of your family, yeah. which up until a few yeah. years ago was owned, unknown to you, yeah. the labor that your family has done to build America, yeah. um, and the labor that we, that the invisible labor of either you know, the artist or the worker yeah. in the creation of things. And one of the nice aspects of this piece is that each of the students put their initials or their name into a woodblock which is incorporated into the work right here. So that that's the, the invisible labor is actually made visible. Yeah, right. We don't do invisible labor here, so I was really happy that the students got to got to put their names into the work. But do you want to talk a little bit about labor more generally too? Sure, so I mean, I guess a lot of that is even illustrated in the spelling of the title of the show, right? So I'm referring back to an older English spelling of labor that has L-A-B-O-U-R. Um, obviously there's a reflection of the word hour inside of labor. So again, just thinking about the, uh, the impossibility of separating the individual from the group activity of labor. So just trying again to demystify the idea of labor as commodity, but as group activity and as community and family. And part of an identity too. Absolutely. And identity is a big part of this too, like the creation of the of both the Our Labor mural and Auntie Grandma is a process of you learning about your family and finding your place in the family too. Right, and this all started from a, a DNA test. So I did Ancestry.com uh, in order to find my uh, African roots. Um, and my mother is white, my father's black, so I knew that my mother had roots in Poland and Germany, but I wanted to get closer to uh, the African countries I'm related to. And that's when I started to uh, explore that idea of ancestry more in these sculptural works that we'll talk about. So these works are hybrid masks that are both African tribal masks and also um, workers' welding masks. So these are similar to the welding masks that would be used in an auto plant or factory work. As you can see, that's in the back. And then the African tribal mask also has some details here uh, of Art Deco. And Art Deco is a reoccurring theme throughout the show. Again, I'm thinking about the history of Detroit and Art Deco as a design style proposal for a sleek, futuristic, big city ambition. And also uh, kind of how that idea of big capital has collapsed in a city like Detroit and has left people um, out in the cold, so to speak. So um, there's some of that design style embedded into the mask and you'll also notice there's the charred torching because this is my way of activating the mask. Um, a traditional African tribal mask isn't activated until it's been danced in a ceremony. So because I'm disconnected from that ceremony, I'm thinking about activating it in my own, with my own creative labor through the torching, which of course, I think is something you notice also mimics the act of welding. Exactly. And what's also interesting too is you'll notice the installation more broadly 
um, which is that it, all the masks are mounted on a wall, which is wallpapered with this Art Deco wallpaper that Yeshua picked out. And it's really a way for us to tease out um, the Art Deco elements. And there's, there's a lot of um, uh, kind of layering in that the, the, the design on the mask, which, you know, is implies scarification and, and designs that are more traditional also echo the Art Deco designs and that recurs throughout the show. Uh, for those of us who are just joining us, I just want to say welcome to the Wellen. I'm Tracy Adler and I'm joined with Yeshua Kloss and we're talking about the exhibition Yeshua Kloss Our Labor, which will be opening tomorrow and running here at the Wellen through June 12th, so we hope you'll have the opportunity to see it. And right now we're talking about these new sculptures that were made specifically for the exhibition, and I'm actually thrilled to say that the, the mask that we're talking about now, um, we've acquired for the Wellen Museum's collection, so it will be here in perpetuity, and that's something we really try to do at the Wellen as well, is to ensure that parts of the exhibition uh, remain part of the history of the museum through these acquisitions. But there are four different masks, and they all have they all have um, different types of, of masks in terms of the welding mask, but also in terms of the African mask. And those and the, the African masks also have different um, properties as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So again, a lot of my research through my ancestry has led me to go deeper into research of these African tribal masks. So each of these masks has different. Um, different ceremonial purposes, right? I would say, uh, in general, what I'm really excited about is the, the hybridity here, right? So the worker mask is, and again, thinking about identity, is uh, a mask that is to protect the face and the worker, and therefore hides identity. The tribal mask, on the other hand, is meant to conjure an identity and, is, and a new characteristic for the wearer and to communicate that to an audience. So I'm really interested in how those are two totally different functions for masking. And of course now we're, we're in a, a place in time where we're all, all too familiar with wearing masks mm -hmm. at this point. So I think that um, when I think about bringing these masks together, there's this sort of collapsing of, of two histories that I'm really interested in throughout the show. That's my contemporary family history in labor and then further back in my ancestral African history as well. Yeah, and you talk about them both as part of your creative DNA as yeah. well. Yeah, there, throughout the show there's a lot of shout outs, as it were, to like a lot of my creative ancestors. Um, in these up close views of the mask, you'll probably notice that they're made from cubits of maple wood. And those cubits are a reference to cubism. And cubism is of course interesting because through art history in the Western canon, I recall being taught that Picasso was the father of abstraction, yet he gained his insight on abstraction through African mask culture. So this is a way of reclaiming uh, abstraction and cubism at its roots uh, in, the, in the African context. And you also talk about, instead of it being a purely reductive process, yeah. because you're working with these cubits, it's both additive and that they have to be composed and also reductive. And you talk a little bit about how that mimics the printmaking process. Do you yeah. want to elaborate? Yeah, sure. So I'm thinking about these really as collages as well. And the collage always derives first from the printmaking. So here, we're seeing some of the blocks that I've carved from in order to make the source material for the collage, right? So um, I know a lot of printmakers, usually printmakers are finished once they've pulled the print. Mm -hmm. They've carved their block or their etching and then their job is done in terms of the creativity. Now they want to replicate this, the same thing over and over. Uh, I'm actually going the other way and trying to create as many options as I can through various printings and then I cut up and collage and assemble those together. So the blocks behind us are where all of these works begin, which is carving the wood, inking and printing. Those prints then get collaged and assembled into larger works. 
And all of the uh, wood blocks here are actually for pieces in the show. So the, the first one here is the car that exploded. So that car diagram. Um, and then all of the other subsequent elements moving over to this far one where you can recognize components from the Our Labor mural. And this is a case where you actually were replicating a number of prints, whereas usually you're sort of doing it once or twice and then not. So this is more of the assembly line kind of approach um, in yeah. terms of printmaking. So we included these pieces. They are not artworks in themselves, but you know, as a teaching museum, we want to demystify the process of art making and also just to give some insight into how Yeshua works. And um, so their inclusion in the show is just a way of expanding the dialogue and, and, and talking about how these things even come into to, to being. Um, you work in, with printmaking in such a unique way. I've really never seen anyone who approaches it that way. It becomes mm -hmm. like your source material. Like we talk a little bit yeah. about like, you know, how you work from chaos a little bit. Yeah. Do you want to mention that? Yeah, um, so it's beautiful to see all of this work in this context because usually I'm sifting through a lot of uh, scrap materials on my studio floor, right, to make the work. You've seen the studio in process, <laughs> and it is a lot, there's a lot of chaos, but I'm creating order from that mess. So it is maybe the antithesis of being in a print shop, I would say, uh, which is very straight laced and uh, about precision and cleanliness. On the other hand, I'm looking to make a mess and give myself a lot of options that I can see at once and then cut up and collage those together. Yeah, it's like composing from a, from a large group and then selecting. It's almost like a process of editing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Do we have time to look at another work? Okay, yeah, well, cool. so let's look at your pessimism Okay. Here. So Tyla is one of the last works that was created um, before we were able to, to ship them here. And what's really interesting about this is how the incorporation of the Art Deco motifs becomes apparent in some of the elements in the face. And you talk about this as a little bit like, like sort of like a memory or a yeah. shadow. Um, do you want to um, yeah. So the Yeah, so the Art Deco motifs, you notice that those are uh, usually they're 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 untouched. I mean, they're these are wood planks that are attached to the surface and then covered with rice paper, which typically a printmaker would print on. But of course, I'm using it here as a substrate. Um, and the Art Deco is kind of uh, it's it's a memory. It's part of history and not part of the present in a way. So you notice that it's sort of ghostly. It's present, but uh, you know it's also kind of faded away. In this, in this case, it doesn't even have color. And you talked a little bit about the inspiration for yeah. this piece being inspired by one of your legendary artists, yeah. so one of your creative uh, yeah. predecessors. Right, who I also like consider an ancestor. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth Catlett is one of my printmaking heroes in woodblock print, so she did an iconic piece called The Sharecropper. And the sharecropper is an image of a woman with this large uh, regal straw sun hat. And I found uh, an image of my cousin Tyler wearing a similar hat. And immediately uh, I just felt compelled to follow in the tradition of Elizabeth Catlett. So the beautiful thing about that sharecropper image is like she's, she's giving us context to the labor again through the title. A sharecropper, but she's also depicting this woman as uh, almost as royalty. Yeah. And I think we have time to talk about one more piece, right? So we'll talk about Vane Vine. Nice. What I love about this particular work is that I also feel like the hand becomes a little bit yeah. of, a, of, a, of a type of portrait. It's like, even yeah. it's figurative, but yeah. it's also almost like a figure. And you talk a lot about yeah. hands as being not just the hands of labor, but you know, hands as being part of self-care. Um, uh, obviously, it's delicately holding this flower, yeah. which I think is incredibly um, poetic too. So if you can talk a little bit about the composition. This is a series of work where I've been considering hands as a, one of our most gestural forms, right? 
And of course, there's a, a history of another hero of mine, Charles White, who does figures with these massive hands. So this is in some ways also, again, like a registered recognition of my creative ancestors. Um, you know, my work is, I'm often sort of um, navigating a space where I want to pay tribute to all of this invisible labor that black folks have done in building the country. But at the same time, I don't want to replicate imagery that um, positions the black body as a body designed for labor. So you'll see here that there's these references to labor, like bricks that are sort of tumbling away. In a way, they're almost, uh, they're secondary, they're almost atmospheric, mm -hmm. but the hand is certainly more concerned with these wildflowers that are blossoming and wrapping around it. So there is a moment of rest and self-care here that the hand is prioritizing over the labor. And the scale of the hand, and if you come up and you look at some of the, uh, the printing, it almost appears to look like a landscape. Yeah, you know, and in that tradition of woodblock printing, you have the Japanese tradition, Hokusai Hiroshi J, and we think about the way that they use scale in all those depictions of Mount Fuji, which the size of those images is actually pretty tiny, but of course, it, they feel massive because of their uh, masterful use of scale. So yeah. I'm thinking about how can I create scale and landscape using, uh, using a hand in this case. Yeah, it has a monumental feel to it, absolutely. So um, it seems like we have some questions coming in, so we're really excited to answer some of the questions. We are going to move to another work um, just so that we're showing, highlighting as many of the works in the show as possible as we answer your queries. Alexander Jarman, our assistant curator, is going to be reading out the questions to us. So, Yashua, our first question is more technical, and it's about your color choice. Great. Uh, why do you prefer black and white for some works? Why do you put color in other works? And is there any meaning to the color blue for you? I love this. I love this question. Um, this gives me an opportunity to mention uh, <laughs> some behind the scenes. So when I did the Our Labor mural, originally it was in full color yeah. and I was kind of painting and I showed it to a few people. They loved it, but I couldn't sleep at night and I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized that it was because Diego Rivera had already done that. And I didn't feel like I needed to replicate the masterpiece that Diego did. When I decided to take the color out of it and just use black, um, it became functional for um, a family tree and a diagram, which is what I needed it for. And in that way, I felt um, my own space and my own ownership um, over that history. So that's, what, that's why uh, often I'm choosing uh, that graphic language of black. Obviously, you see that a lot in printmaking and specifically a woodblock print tradition. Um, and the color blue is really exciting and it's certainly uh, displayed prominently throughout the show. We've painted a couple of the walls blue. This certain textured blue is a reference back to um, lapis lazuli, which is an ancient blue that the ancient Egyptians barrel, buried uh, the royalty in. And uh, through art history, you have artists like Eves Klein, of course, who is interested in making body prints with the blue, but I'm, I'm actually more interested in someone like Terry Atkins, who used a, a similar blue because George Washington Carver discovered this blue, and he called it Egyptian blue. Um, for the same reasons I mentioned and tried to copyright it, but he was disallowed the license for that. Um, so, you know, there's some really interesting history with the blue, but blue itself has such a uh, value on it, right? We think about blue blood, blue collar labor, true, true blue. True blue. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many interesting kind of value assumptions that we can place on blue that I'm, I'm interested in. And so, I think also for the Our Labor mural, it being black and white, it's like a black and white photo in a way. Yeah. So it's like hearkening back to this sort of nostalgic era too, um, which is represented through some of the Art Deco yeah. forms as well. All right, Alexander. 
Uh, our next question is for both of you. Tracy, how do you um, and the museum and the college, how are you thinking of um, the ways you're going to use this artwork to teach from? And Yashua, what are you hoping people will learn from your work? Well, one of the things as a teaching museum, when we're working with an artist, it's, it's part of the conversation from the very beginning, thinking about some of the, the themes that will be accessible to different disciplines, thinking about how faculty and students will engage with it. It's part of the entire process and the entire thought that goes into it. Um, and Yeshua will also be back uh, for a week of programming where he's meeting with, with students and he's meeting with faculty and he's doing talks and critiques. And it's really a way to um, demystify the process of art through giving access uh, to directly to the artist. But we just know from our, our early conversations that we've already had with, with faculty in different classes across dis disciplines that there's so many elements that will be interested, whether it's you know history of architecture or it's sociology or it's history or literature. There's many different ways and access points to gain entry into the works on view. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I would add to that is just to say that I'm really excited about engaging all kind of diverse thinkers with this show. So we've already like had a lot of discussions about, you know, the exploitation of human labor for capital. And maybe some of the discussions are just about the history of woodblock printing. Um, so this it's it's pretty wide ranging, I think. And, and gender is one of the things that you also yeah. talk about in, in addition to the um, the original Diego Rivera Diego, Diego Rivera mural yeah. being all um, white people, they were also all men, and yeah. you're replacing it with a lot of women because a lot yeah. of your you know you talk about that family as being a matriarchy, and a lot of those women worked in the plants too, and that's the kind of labor that um, often gets forgotten. Absolutely. Next question is for you, Yashua. Um, going back to the mural that you collaborated with seven students on, yeah. how did you feel their ideas and their personalities ended up shining through in the final piece? Yeah, so great question. I mean, one of the things that I had to, I think, be really present for was in learning which aspects of the process students preferred over others. So that allowed me to kind of step back and I was less hands-on as a creative and probably functioning uh, more like a project manager as I was seeing them sort of sort out what was their individual interests in the process. Um, so you had students that were more excited about carving the wood, some that were more excited about printing it, some uh, did a hand touching process where they're painting onto the print after it's been printed. Um, and I can't really shout out those students enough, you know, I mean, I'm so glad that they got to like put their names into the mural, but um, they're gonna give people tours, I'm sure, of the show as they walk through, and I'm just glad that they'll be able to feel connected to that piece. Next question is for you, Yashua. What has been the reaction from your family um, around the Our Labor mural? Was anybody reticent to be included in the mural, and or was anybody particularly grateful and excited to be in the mural? Yeah, I've had an amazing reaction. They are thrilled about everything that's happening with this show, uh, thrilled about their representation um, being platformed in this way. And I, and I also think, you know, they're just really excited to have portraits. So, you know, again, we talk about uh, printmaking as an opportunity to make multiples, and often I only make one print. For the mural, I did two prints of the portraits. The reason being is that I could have one in the mural, obviously, and then I could gift my family members a print also. And that was a way to invite them into the process and give them access to, more access to me and to, to what I was doing here. Because again, this is a, this is a, a, a learning process. We're both t putting in the time and work to learn each other. But they've been totally thrilled about it. Nobody's been res reticent. Um, I can't wait for them to actually come to the show, see it in the space, because I think that's when things become uh, very real. The only, the only problems that the family members had was when they, were, they felt left out of a, of a piece, you know, which I've tried my best to 
you know, get them in, involved with a piece. Um, next question is for you, Yeshua. What are your thoughts on um, your labor as an artist? Oh, I mean, that's, that's a, wow. I could go many directions with that. Uh, it's kind of a broad question. I, I love that question. I think that, you know, I think the people who know me well um, will say that I work really hard and that that's, I, I guess that would be the thing that I'm most proud of. It's not words that we might associate with artistic work like talent or skill. Those are fine, but to me, um, I pride myself on, on my labor. And I do think that's probably, a, you know, my Midwest upbringing again. It's probably this association with like labor as almost like a, um, some sort of like moral thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at labor as, as a way to stay productive. Um, so yeah, I think as an artist, that's, that's what my, my labor means to me is like a way to always be productive. And what was really exciting was that you wanted to make only work for the show and we wanted to support yeah. you in that. So the show had initially started out as being smaller, but as your growth and investment in it grew, we also tried to be responsive to that and grow the show um, to, reflect your, to reflect your labor and all the, um, the love and care and actual skill, talent, and time that you put into making it. And thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> this is our second to last question, and it's just about the period in which you were making the work, which was obviously uh, a pandemic yep. that we're still in the middle of. And what were the effects of um, the pandemic on the process of creating the work for the show? Well, the, the pandemic allowed me much more time in order to make a 40 foot by 15 foot mural. Um, I was also running out of space in my own studio to produce this mural. So I reached out to a nonprofit in Brooklyn, Brick Brooklyn, big shout out to Brick, and they allowed me space that they wouldn't have had otherwise because of the pandemic, they weren't using their typical uh, gallery rotunda space to, to do an exhibition. So they invited me in to finish my mural there. So I'm really grateful to Brick Brooklyn, um, and that's one of those, I guess, fortunate things that I could mine from such a, you know, from all the, the tragedy of the pandemic, but there was time and space provided because of it. And also, originally, Yeshua was going to do a residency in Detroit and was planning to pose his family members, so it would more truly echo the Rivera mural. And instead, because he sourced these images from social media and elsewhere, it turned into something that's quite different. Yeah. Um, we get to see them at these moments of them enjoying their life, but also it's less literal. And it also gave the opportunity to connect with them one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, I want to use this picture, what do you think? Absolutely. You know? So our last question is actually for both of you. Uh, Tracy, what was the most interesting or surprising aspect of the exhibition um, that happened during the planning process? And Yashua, what has the process of making this exhibition opened up for you in terms of either new ideas or new directions? Well, this is Yashua's first solo museum exhibition. So, you know, starting there when you're working with an artist who hasn't had the opportunity before. And so it was a learn it's always a learning process for all of us on staff here and for our faculty and students who consult and collaborate with us. But I think with, with Yeshua, he was such a equal partner in everything that we were doing. And as, we, as our ambitions grew, we said, hey, we wanna you know, add your thoughts on the wall. So every piece is accompanied by an extended chat that was written by Yeshua. And hey, we're thinking to do this. He was always so game for everything and really wanted to expand upon and grow upon some of the ideas that were the seedlings and i can say seedlings because there's so much growth literally and figuratively in this show and so it was really exciting to be part of that process and with the masks and yeshua's idea about having them on this deco wallpaper and we worked really closely together to develop that into the installation that you see now yeah i mean i mean my, i think my answer would kind of echo some of what Tracy just said, which is I may be spoiled at this point because the Welland really did help me nurture some 
ideas and uh, was really there with me the whole time to kind of see them through. And also, I, I felt like, and I said this earlier, always, it almost functioned as almost like a brain team where we could share ideas and, and bounce ideas off of each other. So I'm really grateful for that. I mean, that's certainly something that I learned as part of my practice, actually, is how to become more collaborative. Um, it, of course, that happened literally with the, the help of seven students helping me make uh, When the Parts Untangle. Uh, I also learned that I could make this large 40 foot by 15 foot piece um, on my own, which was a huge breakthrough in my process. So um, yeah, it's been really interesting to see uh, how to make a show like this and kind of, um, kind of meet the challenge of uh, producing work that I really wanted to see all in communication with each other here. I think that's a great moment to, for us to close on. Again, thank you so much for joining us. The exhibition Yeshua Kloss Our Labor opens tomorrow and runs through June 12th. So please check our website, check our social media. We'll be you know, adding new stories and new aspects of the show. And we hope that you will join us tomorrow. We have an opening from 2 to 5 p.m. And we're just really excited for the exhibition in Yeshua. Thank you for all you've done to make this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you, Wellen. Thank you, everybody joining. Come on. Come to the opening. See you there.